Kia ora guys, good morning, welcome back to the Black Jersey, my name's Max and welcome back to the channel. Um, thank you very much to my patrons as per normal and I'll just remind my new viewers to like this video and subscribe to me if you enjoy my content. Wales versus England has been getting a lot of traction in Twitter comment sections because a lot of people have a lot to say about it. There have been varying amount of um, discussions around it centred around like, it looks like both teams are just trying not to lose. Others are centered around obviously Wales being lined up for a wooden spoon. Others are about how good Borthwick is for England and how much the scrums improved. I've got a lot of things to say about the match that's in my own opinion, but before we get into that part, we have the even more important stuff to get into. We're going to do an analytical um, review of the whole match's uh, footage, and I'm going to chuck in the stuff that I see that's most important to how the final score ended up the way it does. Let's get these scalpels open. Open, let's sterilize them all, let's cut it all open and dissect what happened in the match. Although the average Welsh fan is likely relating to Prince William's facial expressions that we can see, many positives for Wales were shown in the test. Wales are improving. Talupi Falatel's charge down here has altered England's field position from here to here on the pitch, a net gain of metres for Wales. As we can see in this freeze frame, Jack Van Portvliet is correct to pass out the back for a clearance kick as England England are on the back foot inside their own half. Alan Wynne Jones is in a great position, so despite being 73 years old, he'll be able to charge down Van Portfleet's kick if this happens. Though Farrell isn't an ideal position, the fact that he is England's lone specialist place kicker in open space makes it rather obvious to the Welsh defence that he will kick the ball out of England's half, while we can see four players on Farrell's right that are standing in a flat position. The rest of his back line, as we can see, aren't really too awkward organized either. As we can see with the illustrations, hiding Farrell behind a pot of two players would allow him protection for a charge down. In another, we see the possibility of a standard backline formation putting Wales into two minds, about which England player could possibly receive the ball from Van Portfleet. Although Wales didn't get to the England's 22 by the 38th minute, their defence was looking far more solid than previous games, as we'll see with their tackle percentage for the match. As we can see with the ninth minute, they do a great job of snuffing out a carry by Alice Genge as the two-man pod of Ludlam and George is disconnected from him. By going to the pod of Ludlam and George, Van Portfleet will cause England to lose metres, hence why Genge has the ball. As we can see Owens making the tackle, Wales don't rush up too hard, they allow for Genge to pelt himself towards the defence line, though Wales concede metres, this is a perfect opportunity for a turnover, with George and Ludlam not as close to the breakdown as both of the Welsh lot. Though this is superb defence, the breakdown work is not as good, Beard and Jones fail to communicate in their positions, which leads to Beard exiting the ruck completely. Jones, who is not in as good of a position as Beard, still manages to be first into the ruck, but due to this miscommunication, England have time to clear him out. Ollie Lawrence also enters the ruck from the open side. Lawrence's entry gives Owens no legal means of rolling away, with England's turning what should have been a Welsh turnover into a penalty goal for Farrell. After 18 minutes of missed opportunities for both teams, we finally see England construct a proper try without Marcus Smith on the pitch during the Borthwick era. As we can see, Jack Van Portfleet runs the ball after taking it out for the scrum. All seven of England's backs are in frame for this wide shot as Jack Willis has exited the side of the scrum. England's backs have taken the shape of a pot as well, which is a very odd occurrence that goes a long way. Wales have six backs that we can see while Josh Adams is on the wing out of frame. Willis appears to be exiting the scrum to become a ruck clearance option, but as we zoom over to the left, we see Farrell call for Lawrence to sprint in front of him. Van Portfleet is of course tackled by Thomas Williams while Lawrence runs onto the ball at pace. The Welsh loose forwards are getting back on side after the scrum, leaving Owen Williams as the only defender able to tackle Ollie Lawrence. Farrell though has a genius move, possibly copied from his father's Ireland. By using Lawrence to take Owen Williams out from the Welsh defence, Farrell is able to switch into the 12th channel where the very best of his game management shines due to less pressure being on him. Due to the nature of a midfielder's defensive position, they simply don't have a choice to run out of line unless they are marking attackers on the back foot. 
as a scrum has recently ended, England do have the front foot by default. Joe Hawkins needs to hold his position in his own 12 channel as England are on the front foot creating a massive gap in the Welsh defence line. Should Hawkins follow through with this illustration and take the baits, this is a try to England. As Max Malins is a winger who can actually pass thanks to playing some games at 10 for Saracens, Farrell sends him through unmarked. Malins glides past Hawkins, Farrell remains in open space to activate the shape after the next ruck. As Malins hits the paint marking the Welsh 22 line, Josh Adams flies out of no man's land to pull off a tackle attempt on Malins, as Grady is lucky not to leak a penalty try, pulling out of his initial attempts to bring Lawrence down on his second tackle. Now, this is where Willis's early exit of the scrum comes to use. While Mason Grady initially appears to do a great job of slumming England's ball, Willis is able to clean him out uncontested as the Welsh forwards are still getting back on side. While it all looks pretty easy for England from here as Anthony Watson scores, let's now ask the question, why was it so easy for England to score off the second phase? Because England have run this move off a scrum, we now see all five of the Welsh tight five forwards still offside after Van Portfleet has picked the ball up from the ruck. Due to the absence of these players, with Ken Owens and Thomas Francis looking particularly lazy, the Welsh back line has been forced to bite in close to the ruck. Both Thomas and Owen Williams are on the blind side marking nobody. Falatau is still moving across while Adams is completely out of position, he should be over here on the right wing. As the Welsh spine are messing around and not really deciding who goes out wide, Tipperick is forced to mark Ludlam and Farrell as outlined with the two arrows while Rhys Zammert is forced to rush forward and pluck the hole left by Hawkins, who was way, way over here on the blind side despite never entering the ruck, while Lee Halfpenny, who simply hasn't been up to test Santa since 2014, scoring just two tries in the last decade, is still jogging across to Mark Watson. England's clearly rehearsed this try many a time in training, and they deserve a huge amount of credit for putting this eighth wonder of the world together. Halfpenny puts through a penalty goal in the 22nd minute before we see a really nice glimpse of the Welsh attack. As their backline is made up of a young core, good things will take time, but look for nice running rugby such as this to become more common from them in the future. With a cheeky shoulder from Beard to Atoje, this ensures the England's defence can't spread any wider in the 40th minute. With Atoje unable to drift and cover Williams, had Atoje been able to cover, we'd have seen this massive tackle by George that is illustrated in the circle. With George and Sinclair unable to spread, Genge now needs to drift back to his inside to cover some strike runners. Williams makes a beautiful pass to Gareth Thomas as Genge misses the tackle. Thomas goes to ground and Wales generate front football with really quick ruck speed for two phases in a row. Now right here on 40 minutes and 56, Lewis Ludlam does what I would like to call a George Bauer as he remains drawn into a ruck that has clearly already been won by the opposition. Chesham is correct to Mark Jones who is a heavy carrier, while Atoje eyes up Tipperick for the same reason. We cut to the wide shot on 40-57 to see what is a great idea in theory, but not great regarding practical outcome. Adams, he's in perfect position to run straight through this gap, but with Thomas Williams not passing the quickest, it simply won't work out. If we reduce the opacity of the original picture for a bit, do some photoshopping and place Shionza for example in Adams' place, Wales have guaranteed gain line success as they'll be putting through a very strong carrier with front foot ball through the weak shoulders of two defenders for another guaranteed cross of the gain line. Adams, however, is 95 kgs, the same way as when Warren Gatlin plays for the All Blacks, so cannot bust through two weak shoulders. That's a job for someone such as Shionza, as we've illustrated. Although England's don't have any turnover threats for this ruck, this mistake of putting Adams in a position that a forward should have taken results in Wales losing their front foot ball as the ruck takes a long time to form. Wales attempts to reset their attack with Baird as the closest player to Thomas Williams outside. A really slow pass, however, allows for Jamie George to identify a Welsh carrier. The shape of the three-man Welsh pod also gives England a distinct advantage as Jones and France 
Francis are far too wide to effectively clear the ruck. As George, the player organising the England's defence, has identified Baird as the carrier, Jones and Francis' bad pod shape allows Ludlam to get into the ruck first and win the turnover, taking us into half time. Now that we've discussed the first half's footage, I think we'd better chat about the half time stats. As we can see, Wales have had 55% possession and 49% territory, England have had 51% of the territory and 45% of the possession. Um, things are going pretty decently in the Welsh favour, despite the fact that England are up by 8 points to 3 at half time. As we can see, Wales are trying to move the ball a lot more now that Dan Bigger isn't starting. They've made four off, sorry, three offloads rather to the one from England. They've won a lot more rucks, made a little bit fewer metres though, so Wales are obviously just trying to bully the English up front. They're doing a bit of a mixed job in terms of what types of tactics they are using. Wales are trying to flow the ball out wide to no avail and when they're um, holding the ball up front they are doing decently enough but not quite that one percent more to get over England and fully dominate them. Um, it's even enough as we can see with quite similar tackle ratios of 87 percent for Wales to 91 percent for England. The goal kicking from Owen Farrell I'll talk about that later and the ruck success very even as well. I noticed that throughout the match England's ruck speed is far slower than it was back in the Eddie Jones era. Steve Borthwick is trying to get the carries to be much tighter and therefore um, allow the other front rowers more time to get over that ball once the locks and the hooker take it to ground. The line-out success I don't think will take much away from that as that's just one line-out lost by England. The scrum success though, um, yeah, um, pretty dodgy for both teams, um, losing multiple scrums for Wales and one for England. Both in the 60s, there's no real true dominance. That doesn't set in until the second half. The penalties though, England are missing a lot of opportunities. Um, both of the own half penalties for Wales, England does take shots at goal. Um, and obviously they could probably do for more lineouts though. As we can see, they've done three of them, but Wales have conceded four penalties inside the opposition half. Not exactly the brightest signs from the halftime stats, but let's get into the second half analysis because I do think there are positives to take away. What we get almost as soon as the second half starts is a pure piece of magic that is achieved by the bloke who Wales should develop into the next fullback, Louis Rees Zammett. As we can see, Freddie Stewart takes the high ball surrounded by other players before using his frame to take the ball into contact and allow England's to set their attack. Although England's slow ruck speed means they don't have front foot ball, they appear to have an excellent way around it. The ball is recycled by a three-man pod before Van Portfolio's second pass goes out to Farrell. Farrell moves to slot in between two of his teammates before going out the back to Lawrence who could either take the ball into contact, pass out wide or... oh... wait... Lawrence is great, but he's not much of a kicking option. Had Farrell been standing where Lawrence is now, we can illustrate a perfect opportunity for a chip kick that Slade can head for. While such a chip kick will not be collectible by Max Malins as he's straight in behind, Slade is in a perfect position to run through this gap. England have done such an amazing job at dismantling the Welsh defence, because as we can see, Watson is out so much wider than Rhys Zammert, who appears to be a right winger with number 11. 11 on his back. Another opportunity that England have missed though is a possible overlap. If we make a little bit of an edit to the picture again, placing Malins where Slade is, with Slade then moving closer to the blind side, that's a clear 3 on 1 that England could have executed. If this attacking pattern was utilised by Eddie Jones's England only months ago, I'd be willing to bet on this attack structure of England's being a try, as Eddie Jones's England thrived off the use of a 10-12 playmaker axis. A key reason for Wales holding their line and not rushing up towards Malins once he takes the pass is due to England having a lower number of possible playmakers than other teams, as they have Owen Farrell at 10 organising the attack and Stewart, the only other playmaker, at the other side of the pitch. Farrell is a very good playmaker who remains essential in selections. Steve Borthwick's England's though, they are playing off 10 far too much, while Squidge Rugby just makes the blanket statement of, oh you either play off 
of nine or ten that's just how your tactics have to go you've got to consider where on the pitch are you which playmakers are available to organize a strike move and you have to go from there for example right now we can see Faf de Klerk in 2019 the South Africans are playing off nine against Japan we can see against South Africa themselves David Havili is the playmaker the All Blacks are playing off 12 over here and through Hugo Keenan's individual brilliance here we can see Ireland's playing off 15 and of course um, through Marcus Smith against Scotland we can see footage of them playing off 10. Um, England's do need to start mixing that up far more as the Borthwick era goes on. But back to the match day footage, we freeze frame again as Slade stands on halfway as Grady marks Malins. Now that we've paused, we can see an arrow directing the possible passing zones for Malins. The total of these passing zones is one more than the amount of test tries scored by Joe Marler, as the only possible actions for Malins right now are to either A, take the ball into contact, which Let's face it, it's not going to go well due to him being marked by Grady who is big enough to play flanker or B, pass out to the wing. As Slade is calling for the ball, Reese Zammett continues to hold the line before boosting the decibels of Principality Stadium up to a much higher volume as he zooms over the try line to prove that perhaps with such a great rugby IQ, it'll be his chance to shine in an even more important jersey very soon. Considering Reese Zammett's tackle ratio at test level in 2022, I like those odds. Borthwick's overarching game plan of England's dominating Wales up front though, it comes back to life as they get back into the Welsh 22 in the 44th minute. I'd have preferred to have had a maul over here, but England's do a great job in breaking down that enormously awesome Welsh defence very quickly, finally creating a mismatch after drawing lots of defenders in. Itoje drops the short pass off to Kyle Sinclair, knowing there's a severe mismatch. The two Williamses are able to get low, but with no forwards marking Sinclair to assist them, Ludlam puts in a great effort to push Sinclair over them. Talupi Falatau, as we can see from another angle does wrap around from the breakdown to try and stop the try but as we see in this keyframe here he can't quite get low enough and Sinclair dots the ball down to score the try. Although both teams are able to defend their hearts out for much longer England eventually get quicker ball off Alex Mitchell at 9 as we can see in the build up to a try by Ollie Lawrence. Farrell now has much more freedom to organise the attack with a more experienced player at 9 as we see him send what through this defensive gap in the 10th phase. The ball recycling continues thanks to some amazing work by the reserve type 5 forwards as Ollie Lawrence does indeed score the final try this game. Before ending the video and looking at the full time stats though I want to highlight the individual smarts of Henry Slade. Based on the shape of Slade, Stewart and Watson we assume it's an attacking structure nearly as bad as the All Blacks with England trying to float the ball wide for the sake of going wide. Regardless of whether this shape we've paused on is planned or not, Henry Slade is correct to run at the gap we've highlighted and not to pass out wide. Slade is marked, so is Stewart, while Halfpenny is probably in a realistic position to make the try saving tackle on Anthony Watson should Watson run the line showcased by the white arrow. Although Slade doesn't score the try, he prevents the odds of Stewart or Watson taking the ball into contact without a ruck clearance option by going himself. Chesham is able to get over Slade and provide Mitchell with clean ball, sucking in the Welsh defence that has been brilliant all match. The rest is history as England recycle, Stewart passes to Lawrence and he scores. With Farrell failing to convert Lawrence's try, the final score is 10 to 20 for England. Let's have a look at the full time stats and the story they'll tell us. Um, position pretty even which I think reflects the scoreline and what it would be if Wales um, had more guts to take some more shots at goal and stuff. Um, territory definitely wins in England's favour though as we can see with Owen Farrell's kicking percentage that definitely um, wasn't made into the best of opportunities. Owen Farrell in this game as we can see converges just two of his six kicks at goal into points which is not ideal, but um, we also have to talk about what's happening with ball in hand for both teams. Wales were really trying to move the ball far more, but um, I think the fact they were doing the offloads in very tight spaces was probably backfiring a fair bit for them, as that allowed more England numbers into the breakdown. And as we can see with the ruck success, 
England getting those extra numbers into the breakdown allowed them a ratio of 95%, whereas for Wales it's 93%. Teams who lose test matches um, for Tier 1 nations do typically have a lower ruck success than their opponents, as rugby is won by the type 5 forwards. Lineouts, as said before, um, I don't think there's too much to take away. Each team just dropped one lineout. The England scrum in that second half, though, they just started demolishing the Welsh in the scrum. Um, Wales could probably do to invest in some younger props. Um, they've had no problem doing it for the midfielders, which I really liked the look of, as said earlier. I was really happy with Louis Rees Zamet. Um, I was happy with Chris Chionza, but new props. They are a big investment that lots of teams will be needing over the next five or so years as we go from 2023 to 2027 as props it is getting more and more mobile. In terms of more penalties conceded, it's no surprise to see Wales did end up losing as they conceded more of them. This allowed England to gain more of that 55% territory that they ended up finishing the match with. Um, a lot of very weird talking points I guess to bring from this match. It's not the most boring Six Nations game of all time though. A lot of people have discussed it wasn't the most entertaining, but honestly it's got nothing on how boring Wales vs France from 2022 was. Warren Gatland seems to be trying to balance the best possible combo of youth and old age for the World Cup, and I think it was a bit naive of me to expect he would just come in guns blazing and change Wales overnight. As we are one year away from a World Cup, he can't just radically change the team overnight because he does have that to think about. So, long story short, I believe Gatland is trying to get a couple of the old boys to stick around, so his young blood have 2023 as a reference point for 2027. So Wales, um, the wooden spoon is definitely a risk, but I do think they are heading in the right direction despite just narrowly avoiding a strike. And um, I do think England's really need to look out for the French and the Irish. As um, Ireland are the best team in world rugby, France will be pretty annoyed after that loss to the Irish that ended their winning streak. And England's just pure reliance on trying to dominate up front. Is that going to be enough against those teams who play very expensive rugby? And will it be enough against South Africa at the World Cup should they cross paths? Let me know all your thoughts on this game down below in the comment section, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this video. Remember to uh, support me over on Patreon if you can afford it. You can just send me something in my PayPal tip jar if you're just keen to do a one-off donation, I guess. Support me on Instagram and uh, Twitter as well. Thank you so much for coming to watch the video, everybody. Cheers for watching once again. And from Max, this is me signing out.